Greetings out there in YouTube land, and welcome to the House of Jonfeld. What do these three films have in common other than being big hits and making stars out of all the leads? They were all costumed by the marvelous Marilyn Vance. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, she became fascinated with the art of costume design after watching Bonnie and Clyde and being wowed by the works of Theodora Van Runkle. She loved how the clothes were period but reflected the current styles. She later married musician Kenny Vance and had two sons, Greg and Ladd. Marilyn spent the 60s and the 70s raising her family and making and selling hats on the side. Around 1978, her husband was composing the score to the movie The Warriors, and it was on set where she met the film's producers, Joel Silver and Frank Marshall. By coincidence, Silver and Marshall saw Marilyn selling her hats and noticed how she was a shrewd businesswoman and had everything put together real well. The duo were impressed by her and they told her she should be designing costumes for the movies. Marilyn began receiving scripts and her first gig as an assistant costume designer on Xanadu, working for costume designer Bobby Mannix, and then designing the final episode of The Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo, Keep On Buckin'. Jekyll and Hyde Together Again was Marilyn's debut as a costume designer for film. A modern take on the Robert Louis Stevenson book, this silly picture showcased Marilyn's flair for comedy. When Mark Blankfield's character, Dr. Jekyll, transforms into Hyde, he is all pimped out in leather and gold, chains, ready to wreak havoc. However, the film flopped, but Marilyn's next film would establish her as a designer to be reckoned with and put her on the map. When you watch Fast Times at Ridgemount High, it now reads like a who's who in Hollywood. Most of the cast would become stars later in the 80s decade. Fast Times was based on the book of the same name by Cameron Crowe. Crowe actually went undercover at Claremont High School in San Diego, California as a student to do research. The book covered controversial subjects like drugs, bullying, sex, and abortion. The book was a bestseller in 1981 and it was optioned and greenlit as a movie. Crow wrote the script and Amy Heckerling was hired to direct. For her research, Marilyn went to a high school to do research and took pictures of the students. Unfortunately, she didn't know one had to have permission to take photos of minors. The school confiscated the film, but despite this obstacle, Marilyn put together an amazing wardrobe. Fast Times featured Marilyn's prominent use of red that became her trademark color in a large percentage of the clothes. The cheerleader uniforms, the leather jackets, football uniforms, fast food uniforms, and the adorable waitress uniforms that Jennifer Jason Lee and Phoebe Cates' characters, Stacy and Linda, wear. The uniforms consist of a white apron, red and white striped fabric with white collars and cuffs accessorized by bow, red bow ties. The most famous costume from the film is the red bikini worn by Phoebe Cates. In a fantasy scene emerging out of the pool to the cars moving in stereo. Marilyn had a hard time finding the right bikini in LA so she got a Norma Kamali bikini from New York and it fit Cates like a glove. Other memorable outfits that Marilyn put together are Stacy's blue sweater with pink and green embroidery, the ochre Colt 45 t-shirt worn by Sean Penn as Spicoli, and Judge Reinhold's character Brad in a pirate outfit for a seafood restaurant, and this pink and violet cashmere sweater that was popular in the early 80s. Another item that became popular was the checkered shoes. Spicoli hits his face with one of the shoes. The checkered shoes were used in the advertising and they became a signature footwear of the 1980s. Fast Times was a huge hit when released and Marilyn was in big demand. In 1983, Marilyn started work on Romancing the Stone. The story followed the romance between Joan Wilder, played by Kathleen Turner, who played a romance novelist, receives a map from her murdered brother-in-law and learns her sister has been kidnapped in Cartagena, Colombia, and insists the help of Jack Colton, 
both find a large emerald called the El Corazon. Romancing the Stone is a movie that is a lesson in distressing wardrobe. Joan Wilder shows up in a country in clothes that are not suited for the climate and they become dirtier and ragged as she endures the elements like rainstorms and mudslides. One outfit that Joan purchases is a peasant blouse and skirt that beautifully represents the culture of Colombia, and it too becomes ragged and worn as they are pursued by gangsters wanting the El Corazon. In my opinion, the dress becomes more interesting as it gets more worn down. Another item of wardrobe that was essential to the story, albeit briefly, were Jack's boots at the end of the film. Previously, a crocodile swallows the El Corazon and Jack pursues and captures the reptile, then fashioning a pair of crocodile boots after retrieving the stone. Romancing the Stone was one of the biggest hits of 1984, and this was just the beginning for Marilyn. When Marilyn Vance met John Hughes, there was an instant connection. He wanted her to design 16 candles, but Marilyn couldn't because she was working on Romancing the Stone. When The Breakfast Club was given the green light, Hughes immediately recruited Marilyn to dress a brain, an athlete, a basket case, a princess, and a criminal. The Breakfast Club was the official debut of the Brat Pack starring Anthony Michael Hall, Judd Nelson, Emilio Estevez, Molly Ringwald, and Ali Sheedy. The film is set in a high school library on a Saturday morning where five students are in detention. The five characters couldn't be more different, and their clothes reflect this. Andrew the athlete wears a leather jacket, muscle shirts, jeans, and sneakers. Brian the brain, a black sweater and khakis. John the criminal, a trench coat, red flannel shirt, white long-sleeved undershirt, work pants, and combat boots. Claire the princess in a pink top and a brown textured skirt with a pair of expensive brown leather boots. Allison, the basket case, wears dark, shapeless clothes that hides everything about her. Though different, these five students learn they have more in common than they think they do. The Breakfast Club was another hit for Marilyn, and it was the beginning of a successful collaboration of Hughes and Vance. Weird Science, the second Hughes-Vance film, film, was about two teens played by Anthony Michael Hall and Elon Mitchell Smith create the perfect woman named Lisa, played by the gorgeous Kelly LeBrock. Marilyn came up with lively and outrageous items in this wacky comedy using all the bright bold colors associated with the 1980s. Pretty in Pink is perhaps the zenith in the Hughes-Vance collaboration, where Marilyn truly got to show off an indulgent character design. It told the story of Andy, a girl from the wrong side of the tracks and not so popular in high school. In her senior year, her only friends are Ducky, adorably played by John Cryer, and Iona, played by Annie Potts, whose character owns the record shop where Andy works part-time. Since Andy cannot afford the trendy and expensive clothes the other girls at her school wear, she shops the vintage and second-hand places and takes them apart and assembles her own clothes. Which in real life, Marilyn did this very thing, so it was second nature to her. She dressed Ducky as a 1980s hipster in a pork pie hat, round sunglasses, baggy jackets, suspenders, vests, and bolo ties. Years later, on his hit show, Two and a Half Men, Cryer recreated the look, and though it wasn't the original costume, the costume staff did their homework and managed to put together one that was impressively similar. For the prom scene, Marilyn needed to design a prom dress for Andy that was different from what the other girls at school would be wearing. For 80s formal wear, the style was puffy sleeves, full skirts, and bows, and she needed to come up with an outfit that would have Andy stand out from the crowd. In the film, Iona wears a pink 1960 tea gown that she gives to Andy, and her father also gives her a pink gown. Andy then decides to design her own dress and taking, it up, taking apart both gowns and then cutting and sewing the pieces together. Here are several production photos of Marilyn taking apart the dressing and piecing them together, similar to how Andy was doing in the film. 
Here is Marilyn displaying the completed garment and Molly Ringwald wearing the ensemble. It was like the sack dress of the 1950s with bare shoulders and full sleeves. Here's an interesting bit of trivia. Ringwald hated the dress. She told Hughes she didn't want to wear it, but thanks to Marilyn's amazing diplomatic abilities, she was able to convince Hughes that the dress was essential and it was something that Andy would wear. So Hughes told Ringwald she would be wearing the pink dress. Had the Costume Designers Guild Awards existed back in 1986, Marilyn would have won the Best Costume Design in a Contemporary Film Award. Pretty in Pink was another hit in Marilyn's roster. Hughes and Vance's next movie venture was Ferris Bueller's Day Off starring Matthew Broderick as the title character. It told the story of a popular high school student taking the day off from school and recruiting his best pal Cameron, played by Alan Ruck, and his girlfriend Sloane, played by Mia Serra. Marilyn found a sweater and decided to remove the sleeves, and this became the Ferris Bueller vest. For Sloane's character, she dressed her in a white, broad-shouldered fringe jacket that was custom-made for the actress. And for Cameron, she went to her trademark red and dressed him in a red Gordie Howe of the Red Wings jersey that was given to her by the man himself. When released in the summer of 1986, it became a huge hit making $70 million, the 10th highest grossing film of that year. Other films that Vance and Hughes worked on were Some Kind of Wonderful, The Great Outdoors, and Uncle Buck. In 1987 proved to be a big year for Marilyn. She designed her first big period film, The Untouchables. Set in 1930 with prohibition in full swing, Al Capone, played by Robert De Niro, supplies illegal alcohol and controls all of Chicago. It is up to Elliot Ness, played by Kevin Costner, and his team, played by Sean Connery, Charles Martin Smith, and Andy Garcia, respectively. Marilyn did exhaustive research pouring through books and Sears catalogs. She found authentic 1930s sh suits, shirts, ties from antique clothing stores, and doubles were made from actual patterns of that era for the action scenes. Minor controversy arose when Giorgio Armani received a wardrobe credit in the opening title sequence. Armani did provide suits that were worn by extras and some of the leads, but he was never on set discussing what should be worn. Marilyn was the only one who discussed anything with Armani because he was so famous was the reason he got the big credit. The Untouchables struck gold at the box office and rave reviews. Come award season, Marilyn's name was on the list of nominees for an Oscar and a BAFTA nomination, but lost to James Atchison for The Last Emperor and Jeffrey Curlin for Radio Days. Marilyn continued her string of 80s hits with Die Hard, starring Bruce Willis as John McClane, a New York cop trying to save his wife and others taken hostage by German terrorists during a Christmas party at the Nakatomi Plaza in Los Angeles. As with Romancing the Stone, the lead's character wears a costume that becomes dirtier and worn out as the film progresses. John McClane is wearing a white tank top that becomes brown and a pair of nice trousers with a belt that become dirty as well as blood caked. Pretty Woman was probably the biggest hit of Marilyn's career. The story is pure Hollywood fantasy. A wealthy businessman meets a hooker with the heart of gold, fall in love, and live happily ever after. Julia Roberts as Vivian and Richard Gere as Edward were the two leads, and the chemistry between them was electrifying. The film made Roberts a superstar, and it revived Gere's career. Marilyn was like a kid in a candy store designing Pretty Woman, and felt Roberts was her own Audrey Hepburn. When we first see Vivian, she is wearing a mini dress connected with a gold ring, blonde wig, cap, and black boots. You're not going to believe this, dear viewer, but the cap and black boots were Marilyn's personal items. She found the boots in a shop on King's Row in London, and the cap was one she was wearing when the director, Gary Marshall, saw it and loved it, and insisted that Marilyn put it on Roberts. 
One of the highlights of the film was the memorable fashion montage to the Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman theme as she tries on the latest from Rodeo Drive. Or, I should say, Rodeo. Pardon my Texas accent. Two outfits stood out. The first was the brown polka dot dress with the brown belt, white hat with brown polka dot band, and a pair of brown and white shoes. To this day, there are knockoffs of this dress, and it certainly has stood the test of time. The second and most famous is the red silk chiffon evening gown with the long white opera gloves. The gown channels the works of Valentino with a draping and gathering. The gown was on display at the Hollywood costume exhibit curated by Deborah Nadulman Landis, and Pretty Woman was the smash hit film of 1990 and come award season, Marilyn received a BAFTA nomination but lost to Richard Bruno for Goodfellas. One of Marilyn's favorite films to design was 1991's Hudson Hawk. The film was a commercial and critical flop, but in defense of this movie, I found it to be a very funny and entertaining take on the action genre. Bruce Willis played the title character who is blackmailed into stealing the works of Da Vinci. Marilyn clearly had a great time working on Hudson Hawk and it showed in all of her designs. Here are some costume illustrations by the great Lois de Armand of Sandra Bernhard's character Minerva Mayflower and her wacky wardrobe. The Rocketeer was based on the comic book by Dave Stevens and set in 1938. A young pilot named Cliff, played by Billy Campbell, stumbles onto a prototype jetpack that allows him to become a high-flying masked hero. Marilyn thoroughly researched the period and designed a sharp wardrobe. Jennifer Connelly, who played Jenny, never looked lovelier, all swathed in white satin. Her character was inspired by Betty Page, but because of legal reasons, the name could not be used. Here are some of the costume illustrations, two for Timothy Dalton's character, Neville Sinclair, and Cliff's Rocketeer suit, again drawn by Lois de Armand. The Rocketeer suit consisted of double-breasted leather jacket, jodipers, and black boots. For all the male characters, Marilyn dressed them in sharply tailored suits of the 1930s. The film was not the blockbuster Disney had hoped it would be, however it did win Marilyn a Saturn Award from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror for Best Costume Design. Summersby was a remake of the French film The Return of Martin Guerre. The Return of Martin Guerre was set in medieval France and it was decided Summersby would be set in post-Civil War America. After six years, John, or Jack, Summersby, played by Richard Gere, returns to his farm where his life Laurel, played by Jodie Foster, and son Rob, played by Brett Kelly, still reside. Laurel has been happy and content by Jack's absence, for he was an abusive monster. She begins to believe that Jack is an imposter because he is kind to her. Marilyn researched the 1860s using a muted color scheme to show the Summersby family in the after effects from the Civil War. The clothes for the leads were made from cottons and wools and run through the washing machines many times to wash out the newness. Summersby was a hit at the box office and the chemistry between Foster and Gear was immaculate. Used People is my personal favorite of all of Marilyn's 67 films. Set in the late 1960s, it tells the story of Pearl, played by Shirley MacLaine, a Jewish widow and mother of two divorced daughters, Bippy, played by Kathy Bates, and Norma, played by Marcia Gay Harden. Pearl has given up on love and is at her wit's end with her antagonizing family. However, love does come into her life in the form of Joe Melodandri, played by Marcello Mastroianni. This film was close to Marilyn having grown up in Brooklyn and her mother and other female relatives gave her the inspiration for the look of the characters. One interesting area of costuming for Marilyn was the character of Norma. Norma is mentally unbalanced after the death of her child and subsequent divorce. She 
she dresses in, in styles of various movie stars and celebrities. Here you see her dressed as Barbara Streisand, Marilyn Monroe, and Bancroft from The Graduate, Dorothy Faye Dunaway from Bonnie and Clyde. Despite the less than stellar reviews, Used People was a modest hit at the box office. Mystery Men was loosely based on the comic Flaming Carrot Comics by Bob Burden, and it told the story of a group of inept amateur superheroes with no superpowers who must save the day when a villain threatens to destroy the city. Marilyn let her imagination run wild when coming up with the costumes for The Bowler, Blue Raja, Shoveler, Mr. Furious, Spleen, Invisible Boy, and Captain Amazing. The film unfortunately flopped at the box office, but Marilyn's work received good notices and earned her another Saturn Award nomination, but she lost to Trisha Bigger for The Phantom Menace. As I mentioned earlier in this video, Marilyn became fascinated with costume design after seeing Bonnie and Clyde and becoming familiar with Theodora Van Runkel's work. Q, 45 years later, and Marilyn got to do her own version of Bonnie and Clyde for the Lifetime Network. This project brought her back to the 30s, and she created authentic clothes from that era and even recreating the wardrobe of Bonnie and Clyde from old photographs. Here are a few of Centra Martel's illustrations of Marilyn's designs. Just looking at them, you can feel the softness and wools of the cotton and the cottons. She should have been nominated for an Emmy for this, but sadly, she was overlooked. In the early 90s, Marilyn made the transition to producing, which still working as a costume designer. When asked, she just said it was a natural progression of her career. Films like The First Power, Judgment Night, The Getaway, Time Cop, and Embrace of the Vampire, and shows like Pacific Blue, Red Letters, Unknown Sender, and she occasionally would direct a couple of episodes of the late night cable show, Intimate Sessions. In 2009, the Costume Designers Guild presented Marilyn the Lacoste Career Achievement in Film Award, and her granddaughter Madison was her escort for that evening. I would like to cover Marilyn's personal style. It's what I'd call beatnik chic. She can rock an evening gown with the best of them, but she is at her best in a jacket, vest, trousers, and fedora. I can see her at a coffee house in Greenwich Village reciting poetry as she is accompanied by a bongo and saxophone player. My pal Mika Sharafian started a movie night at the Costume Designers Guild and one of the movies was Pretty Woman with Marilyn putting in an appearance with a Q&A session. When I heard about the plans I immediately got a hold of Mika and told him I wanted to give Marilyn a tribute illustration I did. So I overnighted it and Mika gave it to Marilyn and in a video she said this is a keepsake and hope to meet me one day. I'm so touched. I hope to meet you too Ms. Marilyn. Lately Marilyn has been devoting her time to a podcast she founded with her publicist and manager Martika Ibarra called Designing Hollywood. Interviewing creative talent like Sandy Powell, Sammy Sheldon Differ, and Oscar winner Ruth Carter. Her son Lad said that his mother has more ambition than anyone he knows of, and he's right. Marilyn is an artist that never stops learning, for her life is an endless art project and is always on the hunt for the next artistic output. I hope you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe, and that's the way the cow ate the cabbage.